Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 666, New Information. Lumian had rarely seen Penitent Baneful act so abnormally. He asked with anticipation and curiosity, What have you discovered? Baneful, clad in a clergyman's black robe, his charred body partially tainted by black flames, averted his gaze and replied in a deep voice, The night conceals the flowing sin. With that, the penitent stepped into the void and vanished from the room. The night conceals the flowing sin. It's emphasizing the night because that allows entry into the special dream. What does the flowing sin refer to? Can't you mysterious types speak plainly? Lumian criticized, then opened Franca's letter and quickly read it. To be honest, after such a long time, his desire to understand the humanoid sealed artifacts past had significantly diminished. After all, he had mainly felt the other party's state was similar to his own, triggering his emotions back then. That was why he had suggested it. Now, those emotions had long settled. Of course, they had only settled, not disappeared. Lumian tore open the letter and jotted down the entire incident, planning to send it to Madame Magician at noon the next day. As for whether the Major Arcana cardholder would agree to such an unequal trade, Lumian wasn't too confident. However, he intuitively felt that the Tarot Club's Major Arcana holders wouldn't simply take possession of important artifacts from the Orthodox churches. Using this opportunity to make a deal was more likely. After leaving the Briu Motel, Lumian calmly observed Camus, donned in a yellow vest, emerge from a dimly lit street corner. Beside him was Re, a member of the local patrol wearing leather armor and carrying a hunting bow. Why two people today? Lumian chuckled and strode towards Hisoka's house. Camus took a deep breath to calm his sudden surge of emotions. As he followed Louis Berry's left hand, he replied in a deep voice, there are only a few days left until the 17th. An accident might happen at any moment. We can't act alone anymore. Having consciously gathered various information, the patrol team had already noticed some abnormalities. This made Camus feel that staying in Tizimo was unwise. He was constantly on edge. He felt a growing sense of being a middle-aged man burdened with heavy responsibilities. Raising an eyebrow, Lumian queried, Hey, you figuring out the 17th is a key date was pretty fast. We're not fools, Camus finally couldn't help but reply. It's an obvious issue. Last year, Tizimo was attacked on December 17th and in previous years. At this point, he fell silent. He realized that when around Louis Berry, he constantly switched between his heavy middle-aged state and uncontrollable teenage emotions. Lumian asked with interest, what happened in previous years? Camus fell silent for a few seconds before saying, We obtained the funeral registrations for nearly three decades in Tizimo from the St. Seen Cathedral and discovered a peculiar phenomenon. Eighty percent of the annual deaths are recorded within the first three months starting mid-December. This place isn't like many northern continent places. Winters are bitterly cold there. It's difficult for the elderly and weak to survive. Even if they do, it's summer from late December to late March. This phenomenon is abnormal. Lumian advanced slowly and nodded slightly. Is the mortality rate in Tizimo higher than elsewhere? Significantly higher, but that's mainly due to attacks from the primitive forest tribe. Also, we discovered the tribe's attacks concentrated in the three months beginning mid-December. There have been two to three attacks annually, and since the one on December 17th last year, not a single one has occurred. The situation doesn't seem right. Camus was a little worried a major attack would occur in the next few days. Hey, hey, it's understandable the tribe's attacks concentrated in those first three months. Any other abnormalities? Lumian asked casually. Re, who had been silently following, responded. The brown-skinned, brown-haired woman, exuding a wild beauty, spoke in a raspy voice. In the first half of this year, many women in town and the plantations experienced symptoms of nausea, soreness, bloating pregnancy symptoms. They believed they'd been victimized by a ghost and might birth evil fetuses, but they weren't actually pregnant. Just illusions. 
After Padre Kali held Mass and briefly purified them, they received psychological comfort and quickly returned to normal. We've also noticed similar incidents of perceived possession and attacks by evil spirits in Tizimo over the years concentrated in that first half. It's not just pregnancy symptoms, Camus added. Mumian halted in his tracks. Don't the townsfolk and the people in the surrounding plantations find it strange that mass hysteria occurs every year? As a member of the local patrol team, Ree explained simply, everyone believes it's caused by the primitive tribe in the forest. Why? Lumian resumed his nocturnal stroll. Ree's vocal cords seemed damaged, and her voice was always a little hoarse. In the repeated attacks and conflicts, the primitive tribe displayed the ability to control corpses, ghosts, and shadows. Furthermore, some warriors seemed to continue protecting their tribe in their spirit form after their deaths. Death domain? Ha, the entire matter seems logical on the surface. No wonder the Tizimans who left town didn't find anything amiss and didn't raise the issue. Lumian had seen records of the primitive tribe, but they weren't as specific as Ree's description. After inquiring about the recent information the patrol team had gathered, Lumian stopped in front of Hisoka's house and turned to glance at Ree, who was carrying a hunting bow and arrows. You're from the southern continent, but not from Tizimo. Ree nodded and calmly said, I'm from the forest. I'm from one of the primitive tribes called Paka. We mainly live near the Paz Valley. The rainforest of the southern continent spanned a vast expanse, encompassing numerous territories. From the area near the Paz Valley to the vicinity of Matani, the distance might be even greater than that between Kordu and Trier. Paka meant wind in Dutanese. How did you come to Matani? Lumian asked curiously. Ri let out a chuckle. I was sold here. She paused for a moment before continuing. Ten years ago, my tribe was attacked by the Lone Kingdom's army. I was captured and sold repeatedly before arriving in the northern state. Later, I found a chance to escape and fled to Port Pylos. I received help from the church and found work. Eventually, I was lucky enough to become a Bayonder. The patrol team member calmly recounted her past, not dwelling on any pain or torture from those experiences, nor deliberately avoiding details. No wonder you believe so devoutly in the eternal blazing sun. Lumian ascended the stairs to the second floor and said in an even tone, Did you keep using a bow instead of firearms out of habit? Yes, tribes named for the wind excel at archery. Rees light. Brown face softened. Lumian glanced back at her. Did you ever go back to take a look? Rees fell silent for a few seconds. They're all dead. Lumian and Camus retreated their gazes in silence as they climbed the final stairs and entered the second floor of the house. Lumian surveyed the spacious yet rudimentary surroundings, listening to the wild roars from the primitive forest. He sat cross-legged. He had intended to tell Ray, it's impossible for your entire tribe to be wiped out. Some must have been captured and sold like you. They could still be alive on plantations, in mines, or seedy bars but he held back. He could tell Ree had accepted her current life and gained the ability to live better. It seemed inappropriate to encourage her to risk traversing both continents seeking potential remaining clansmen. Just the thought of such an endeavor was daunting. With so few clues and them likely scattered far, it could prove quite dangerous. Even spending a lifetime, one might never complete it. Not everyone with a similar experience would sacrifice a normal life for vengeance or seeking others. Ree likely realized some clansmen survived, but perhaps those most important to her had perished. She chose to stay in Port Pylos. Everyone makes their own choices. I can't ask the same of others just because of my own obsessions. Lumian composed himself and smiled at Camus and Ree, who were still standing. Would you like to explore the potential venue for the Dream Festival? Where? Ree blurted out. Camus furrowed his brow. Here? Quickly making a guess, he asked, Do you come here every night to sleep and access the Dream Festival's location? Is it in a special dream? Quite smart, 
Lumian praised Camus inwardly for his quick thinking, but his smile remained unwavering. Care to experience it? Camus and Re exchanged glances and agreed, I'll experience it. Re, keep an eye on the surroundings. I can set some traps, Lumian offered. He stood up and spent a few minutes setting up warning traps nearby. Afterward, he lit a mosquito-repellent candle, placing it in the middle of the spacious second floor. Mosquitoes that hadn't flown away landed on the ground, emitting flames and smoke amidst crackling sounds. Sleep here, Lumian instructed Camus and Re as he sat cross-legged again. He had confirmed that sleeping anywhere in Hisoka's house at night allowed him to enter the special dream. Sleeping outside or sleeping two hours earlier didn't have the same effect. Perplexed, Camus and Re found seats and leaned against different wooden pillars, attempting to enter a deep slumber. After an unknown period of time, Camus suddenly woke up. Before him was the night and the crimson moonlight outside the window. Louis Berry stood behind the flickering mosquito repellent candle, wearing a golden straw hat. The adventurer playfully remarked, Welcome to the Dream Festival. Chapter 667 Approaching Gentleness Camus's nerves tensed as he propped himself up on his left hand, surveying his surroundings warily. He realized he was still on the second floor of Twinaku's house. Ri, who had been leaning against a wooden pillar, stood up in a daze. Everything around him seemed no different from before he had fallen asleep. Are you joking? Camus asked Louis Berry cautiously. What kind of dream festival is this? This feels like a normal awakening after a nap. Lumian turned and pointed out the window. Listen to the forest sounds. Camus and Re instinctively listened, realizing that the nearby forest was eerily silent, as if all its inhabitants had fallen asleep in the night. W.H. Re's eyes narrowed. Born and raised in the primitive forest and having lived in Tizimo Town for nearly a year, she knew the forest wouldn't be in such absolute silence. Lumian pointed at the floor beside the mosquito-repellent candle. Look here again. Camus and Re looked over, realizing that the mosquito corpses that should have been there were gone. Lumian chuckled. Of course, you can also believe that I woke up early, cleaned up the environment, and secretly affected your hearing of distant voices. All of this was just a prank. Camus pondered for a few seconds. I'm inclined to believe you, but I need to confirm something. Indeed, Re chimed in, carrying a hunting bow and arrows. Lumian looked at them and nodded slightly. He calmly concluded, I can now determine that the reason I remain conscious in this peculiar dream stems from a hidden power within Hisoka's house, not any special traits of my own. He had invited Camus and Re to slumber in Hisoka's house and enter the special dream not merely to share information with the patrol team and gather a few aids. No, it was also an experiment to uncover key details. Over the past few days, Lumian had conducted numerous similar trials, grasping the dream's nuanced patterns like a seasoned explorer mapping uncharted lands. With hands tucked nonchalantly in his pockets, he trailed behind Camus and Re, who hurried downstairs. He wanted to witness how they would confirm whether this was indeed a dream. After departing Twinaku's house, the two patrol members rushed to the nearest townsperson's abode. Upon realizing the livestock had vanished from the ground floor, Re swiftly ascended to the second story and attempted to unlock the door with a simple iron black key. Camus opened his mouth as if to dissuade her, but in the end remained silent. Observing this, Lumian nodded thoughtfully and muttered to himself, a bayonder of the Arbiter pathway will subconsciously maintain the current order, unwilling to disrupt its fabric. If such bayonders also bear official identities, this tendency only intensifies. Re rapped upon the door and entered the dwelling. She and Camus scoured each room, but the resident family had seemingly evaporated into thin air. Then, the pair made their way to the police station near the St. Seen Cathedral's hallowed grounds. The local patrol quarters held five rooms in total. Colobo, Maslow, and Lobin were nowhere to be found, nor were the two officers meant to stand the night watch. I now believe this is a dream, 
Camus declared to Louis Berry, who leisurely trailed with hands tucked in pockets, a golden straw hat shading his features. Yet I'm so utterly awake that it defies the very notion of a dream. Before Lumian could respond, Ree's light brown face furrowed slightly. When I ran down the street and searched these rooms, it felt a little familiar. Familiar? Lumian asked calmly, his brows unfurrowed. Could there be unexpected gains from this experiment? Ree pondered for a moment. I think I've had a similar dream before. In my dream, it was just as dark and quiet. The streets were empty, and I was alone. I ran around, searching. Was it a mere fragment or a complete dream? Lumian pressed. Rethought for a few seconds. I don't know. I only remember a few such scenes. Do you often dream of this or only occasionally? Lumian guided her to confirm the details. Re replied with certainty, occasionally. Occasionally. Even if the Tizimo residents don't slumber here on a specific date, they can occasionally enter this peculiar dream, yet remain unable to stay awake. Like a normal dream? Perhaps it's not true immersion, but rather an unconscious development spiritually spawned from the crimson moon and other environmental elements, allowing them to vaguely interact. Unfortunately, Re clearly doesn't recall the moon, weather, and other situational details from those dreams. If I could employ dream divination, I could aid her recollection. The few tismans I queried in Port Pylos made no mention of such dreams. Firstly, dreams so ordinary often slip the mind. Secondly, they've been away from Tizimo for years. As Lumian's thoughts raced, he turned to Camus to see if the interrogator had any queries. Camus pondered for a moment before asking Re, What do you think is special about the residents of Tizimo? Very perceptive. Since this dream seems to affect the entire town and surrounding area, it's likely these people will display some abnormality in waking life. Lumian nodded inwardly. Rethought for a moment. Nothing special, it's just that they're very obedient. At this, reside. They're extremely polite to others. Gentle personalities, stable emotions, very obedient. Even when angered, they quickly calm down. When trouble arises, they tend to let the authorities handle it instead of fighting amongst themselves or causing public disturbances. These were all situations Lumian had heard Camus mention and seen in the corresponding intel. On the surface, nothing seemed amiss. It was a state of being tamed. Re added, their only issue is a lack of enthusiasm. It's not that politeness masks an underlying coldness or hatred. They're simply unenthusiastic, as if reluctant to openly display emotion. Upon hearing this, Lumian recalled the Tizimans he'd interacted with over the past few days. Apart from some gentlemen and ladies from the northern continent, the others were calm, gentle, and disinclined to argue. They always communicated politely. Immediately after, he recalled the Tizimans questioned in Port Pilo's fear, worry, ingratiating expressions, vivid emotions clearly different from the Tizimo townspeople. Most of their emotions have been drawn away into the dream. Lumian finally pinpointed an abnormality about the Tizimans. Their issue clearly didn't stem solely from attacks by the primitive forest tribe. Upon hearing Lumian's guess, Camus couldn't help but hiss. I knew it. The Tizimans feel, strange, too docile. Even livestock occasionally grow agitated, resists. Could the reason be? Ree's heart skipped a beat as she said solemnly, voice laced with fear, I've been here nearly a year, and I feel much gentler. My most intense emotions haven't dissipated. They're still in my heart, but most of the time, it's as if I'm asleep. Ree began analyzing herself. From the looks of it, everyone in Tizimo will gradually be affected by this peculiar dream. After leaving, they can slowly escape its influence. Lumian glanced at Camus. For outsiders like us, who've only been here a few days, there's no issue for now. Perhaps we'll also become unnaturally gentle if we linger too long. Without waiting for Camus's response, Lumian inquired, When will reinforcements from the patrol team and Admiral Guard arrive? At the mention of this, Camus's expression soured. He gritted his teeth and cursed, 
those selfish bastards, it's very likely there won't be much support. The Admiral Guard said they already have a Bayonder team here and an army. Only Captain Riza expressed backing for the patrol team. Damn it, those dodged. Lumian was taken aback for a moment before bursting into laughter. The newly formed organization under the Aboriginal Admiral was indeed different from the official Northern Continent organizations. If this were the Eternal Blazing Sun Church or Church of Earth Mother, the official Bayonders would have already devised a plan and dispatched sufficient force to resolve the issue. They'd be prepared to obliterate Tizimo if anything went awry. The current situation is Admiral Quirrell believes that with me, a famed adventurer backed by the Church of the Fool, here I'm able to use its power to resolve Tizimo's troubles. Is there a need to send more Bayonder subordinates to aid me? That's true. Bayonders aren't commodities. If too many powerful ones perish, not only will Admiral Quirrell feel the strain, but he won't be able to effectively rule Matani. Recruitment alone can't quickly fill such a gap, and they won't be quick to trust newcomers. Even nurturing the remaining people with a retrieved Bayonder characteristics poses huge problems. Low-sequence Bayonders are manageable, but mid-sequence advancement carries high failure risk. After all, most here haven't mastered the acting method. Lumian quickly grasped Admiral Quirrell's mentality. He said to the agitated Camus, let me show you around this dream realm and provide an introduction. All right. Camus took a deep breath. He and Re followed Lumian through the dark, silent, vacant town. After a long while, Lumian led the two patrol members into the primitive forest. He informed them he'd seen Twanaku's image in the chaotic zone ahead, seemingly composed of dream fragments. He suspected there was a desire apostle mark present. Walking amongst the trees, giants in the night, Camus felt increasingly oppressed. Before he could inquire about Twanaku's image details, he suddenly heard a bowstring drawn taut. Pa! An arrow, entwined with lightning, flew from afar. Camus dodged just in time as it grazed past, piercing into a rubber tree behind him amidst crackling lightning and charred bark. Lumian, Camus, and Re gazed into the distance, spotting a woman standing on a huge tree branch. The woman wore dark leather armor, holding a hunting bow and arrows. Her brown hair was tied in two strands draped over her shoulders. Her light brown skin and wild, beautiful face couldn't hide the coldness and hatred behind her eyes. Re. It was Re. Chapter 668. Dream Person? Re gazed at the figure perched on the tree branch, a surreal scene playing out before her like a dream. Correction, this was a dream. The other Re's frigid expression masked a deep-seated hatred as she drew the bowstring once more, causing the arrow to crackle with silver lightning. As Lumian contemplated teleporting behind Re on the tree to probe her control in this eerily realistic dream and question her about her apparent knowledge of the situation, his surroundings quivered and fragmented into disjointed scenes. The scenes overlapped and promptly shattered. Simultaneously, Lumian, Re, and Camus opened their eyes. Crimson moonlight spilled through the window, accompanied by the primal roars of wild beasts from the nearby forest. They found themselves still on the second floor of Hisoka's house. Camus jolted upright, eyeing the mosquito-repellent candle that had burned out, leaving behind a mere stub. Charred mosquito corpses littered the area. Are we awake? Have we returned to reality? Camus questioned, uncertainty clouding his expression. Leaning against a wooden pillar, Lumian chuckled. That should be the case, but I won't claim we're 100% out of the dream. We'll need to verify through various details in the coming period. The simplest method involved checking Ludwig's whereabouts and state. Although asking Termiboros could provide an accurate answer, there was no guarantee the fellow would answer or respond truthfully. Camus nodded, his gaze shifting to Re, who had remained silent since waking up. After a brief pause, he spoke. We seem to have witnessed another version of you at the dream's boundary. Another Re, embodying entirely different emotions and states. Re stayed silent for a moment before admitting, I saw it too. She appears much like the intense emotions I mentioned earlier, the ones slumbering in my heart. 
Lumian adjusted his golden straw hat, standing up on his own legs. He spoke thoughtfully. Could that dream absorb the intense emotions in Tizimo and give rise to the corresponding dream person, an even more extreme and emotional entity? So, the longer one stays in Tizimo, the more subdued they become. Camus concurred with Louis Berry's hypothesis and re-nodded in agreement. Mirror people, dream people, how many peculiar entities lingered in the shadows of this world? Lumian massaged his temples and strode towards the stairs leading to the surface. That concludes tonight's attempt, he casually declared. Camus and Ree followed closely, confirming their escape from the dream through the return of livestock and the commotion in the house. They waited until Lumian entered the Briou Motel before halting, concealing themselves in the shadows diagonally opposite. Lumian pushed open the door to the suite, spotting Ludwig at the dining table, devouring a roasted banana with gusto. In his other hand, he wielded a child's fork, delving into a special salad crafted from the heart of a palm tree. Observing this, Lumian was certain that this wasn't a dream. He cast a glance at Lugano, who was dozing off, and nonchalantly inquired of Ludwig, Do you dream when you sleep? Despite being occupied, Ludwig replied, yes. Lumian nodded thoughtfully. Taking a moment between bites of grilled river fish, Ludwig responded, yes. What dreams did you have? Lumian removed his golden straw hat, stowing it back into his traveler's bag. Ludwig replied with a muffled voice, eat, eat, eat. Indeed, I shouldn't expect much. Lumian chuckled self-deprecatingly and turned his attention to Lugano. What dreams did you have? Is there something wrong with the dreams here? Lugano contemplated asking but decided to answer truthfully. All kinds of dreams. He paused before adding, Perhaps it's been too long since I went out alone. Haha, -ha, I didn't have a chance to release my pent-up emotions. Occasionally, I dream of women and such matters, only to realize that something was amiss. Either the target transformed into a monster, or the initially alluring woman was covered in tree warts, wheat, and mushrooms. Then, I'd wake up in shock. As an intision, he had no reservations discussing such topics. According to the psychology taught by Anthony, your pent-up desires and fear of the dangers in Tizimo are a mix of unresolved factors. Lumian commented inwardly and smiled. If you can explore the giant boa bar alone, find a local lady, or mingle with the ladies and maids in the plantation outside. As long as you ensure food for Ludwig, he'll manage on his own. Initially, Lugano's heart raced, but the potential dangers outside soon came to mind. Lumian headed towards the master bedroom, leaving a parting sentence with a smile. Of course, I can't guarantee those ladies won't turn into monsters or undergo anomalies after your little adventure. Lugano couldn't help but shudder at the imagined scenario. He glanced at Ludwig, finding comfort in staying by the boy's side. Until all the stored food was consumed, he considered himself safe. In the shadows diagonally opposite the Briou Motel, Re observed in silence for a while before suddenly speaking up. Since there won't be any new reinforcements from the Admiral Guard and only Deputy Captain Risa will come from the patrol team, why didn't you leave Tizimo directly? Why did you stay here and attempt to resolve the Dream Festival problem? As long as he escaped Matani, the Admiral Guard and patrol team wouldn't have the resources to track and punish them. At most, they could issue a wanted poster, but they wouldn't be able to pay a high bounty. Camus scratched his disheveled brown hair, smiling wryly. As you know, my previous sequence was a public security officer. It tied seamlessly with the patrol team's usual work, making me yearn to maintain order in Matani and safeguard the lives of the people here. The potion not only brings strength, but also affects you in many ways. He exhaled and continued, Besides, Captain Risa is about to arrive. I have to help him. I have to repay what I owe him. Camus didn't disclose another reason, his confidence in the adventurer Louis Berry and the Church of the Fool behind him. He believed that with Louis Berry present, the situation would be threatening but not perilous. 
Ree didn't press further, continuing to gaze diagonally at the Briou Motel. Camus glanced at her. What about you? Why don't you leave Tizimo with Lobin and the others now? The three of you can form a team. Some local admirals will be willing to take you in. Ree's eyes remained fixed on Louis Berry's suite as she stayed silent. After a prolonged silence, just as Camus thought she wouldn't answer, Ree suddenly spoke. When I was in the most pain and despair, it was the church who helped me. After that, it was the patrol team who gave me a new beginning and a new life. Recalling the cold Ree's face filled with hatred in the dream, Camus sighed sincerely and said, It hasn't been easy for you. The moment he finished speaking, Ree sneered. You're the most contradictory person I've ever encountered. In the past, I've often heard you talk about which states and islands the Faina Potter Kingdom should invade, which mines and valleys they should seize, and how they should establish more colonies in the southern continent. But now you're showing pity towards me. I can sense your sincerity. You genuinely feel pain for me, but that's why I can't help but want to say something. Camus found himself at a loss for words. Indeed, it was a contradiction. He also realized that Ree's emotions had become even more turbulent after encountering herself in the dream. She seemed more willing to open up. Could this be the result of encountering extreme emotions? Or perhaps those who hadn't spent more than a year in Tizimo might resist the dream's influence to some extent if they grasped the truth of obedience? Camus quickly thought of the plantations outside the town and individuals like Sir Petit, Miss Amandina, Monsieur Robert, and the others. These gentlemen and ladies weren't easily subdued. The special dream had evidently encompassed both the out-of-town plantation and the garrison barracks. Camus figured out the reason. These gentlemen and ladies spent at least half their time in Port Pilos each year. This also explained why he was familiar with them. At noon the next day, shortly after Lumian dispatched the letter, he received a prompt reply from Madame Magician. Did the eternal blazing sun church present this price, or was it your offer? Can a grade one sealed artifact be exchanged for such trifles? If I didn't know the kind of person you are, I would suspect that you concealed more than half of the offer from the eternal blazing sun church. In addition to the information related to this grade one sealed artifact, Ensure the Eternal Blazing Sun Church provides an additional 50,000 pounds worth of gold at the highest exchange rate in the past three months. Don't worry, gold is the last thing they need. Gold worth 50,000 pounds, that's approximately 1-2 million virl door worth of gold. Why would Madame Magician require such a substantial amount of gold? Recalling the importance of gold in mysticism, the armored shadows need to reconstruct its golden body, and the widespread use of gold in death-related domains, he swiftly arrived at a realization. A subtle detail caught his attention. Madame Magician used the Lone Kingdom's gold pound to express the value of gold. Does this imply her recent activity in the Lone Kingdom? Lumian nodded thoughtfully, considering whether to summon Jenna's messenger, Rabbit Chasel, to convey Madame Magician's request, or to return to Trier personally for discussions on the Dream Festival with Franca, Jenna, and Anthony. Chapter 669, Connivance Recalling Franca's meeting with 07 tonight to discuss dealing with Morin Avigny, Lumian decided to summon Jenna's messenger, Rabbit Chasel as he had to return to Trier tomorrow to discuss the division of labor and specific details. After jotting down Madame Magician's request and folding it, Lumian set up a ritual, allowing the special rabbit of knowledge to emerge from the candle's flames. The first thing Lumian noticed was the miniature half-top hat snugly perched between the rabbit's ears. Next, he saw gold-rimmed glasses and a black trench coat that matched the vaguely rabbit-shaped creature's size. Finally, an iron-black revolver lay in the rabbit's palm. The revolver gleamed with a metallic luster, its barrel unusually thick and its cylinder unnaturally large and textured. It stood in stark contrast to the illusory appearance of the top hat, trench coat, and gold-rimmed glasses. Upon seeing Rabbit Chasel, Lumian raised his eyebrows. Is this a real gun? Hidden behind the gold-rimmed glasses, Rabbit Chasel's eyes sharpened. Yes. 
Did Jenna customize it for you? Lumian inquired. Rabbit Chasel replied succinctly, It's payment. Quite a cold demeanor. Miss Celia Bello, have you considered the consequences of what you've done? You haven't, because I don't know the consequences either unless I consult Madame Magician. Lumian criticized inwardly before handing the folded letter to Rabbit Chasel. Seeing the human-like, rabbit-shaped creature preparing to turn and walk into the candle flame, Lumian, the prankster king of Cordu, asked with interest, Can you shoot? Rabbit Chasel fell silent for a moment, as if embarrassed. Not yet. Oh, you're not as cold as Jamin Sparrow anymore. Lumian chuckled and said, Jenna and I are friends. I'll help her pay the postage fee this time. Do you want to learn shooting? It involves knowledge and guidance. Rabbit Chasel, taller than an ordinary rabbit, replied without hesitation, sure thing. Lumian's smile broadened. After finding a secluded spot at the edge of the primitive forest and earnestly teaching Rabbit Chasel how to shoot for a considerable time, Lumian strolled back to Tizimo with his hands in his pockets, planning to visit the only café for afternoon tea. The café bore the name Bunya after its owner, a man named Bunya. He was under the age of 30. Having once served as a waiter and apprentice at a café in Port Pilos, Bunya, recalling the lack of a proper café in Tizimo town, transformed the ground floor of his house into a semi-open café. Lumian, weaving through the tables and chairs on the street, arrived at the kitchen counter, offering a smile to the proprietor and waiter, Bunya. Do you have Fermo coffee? Bunya's brown skin, not too dark, and his features resembling those of mixed blood, showcased his Tisman heritage. The man in his late twenties responded with an honest smile in fluent intision. Monsieur, there's no Fermo coffee. Lumian, intending to playfully inquire, casually switched to a cup of Corsa coffee from Matani. Sipping the bitter and sweet liquid at a table, he noticed Camus, adorned in a vest, and Re, clad in leather armor, entering the café. Each ordered an Intis coffee and a corn nut cake imbued with Tizimo flair. Upon spotting Re, the single Bunya became even more bashful and busier, avoiding eye contact. As Camus and Re, equipped with their coffee and corn nut cakes, sought a spot, Lumian raised his arm in greeting. As Camus and Re reluctantly settled into their seats across from him, Lumian inquired with a smile, Why do you look so tired? Glancing at the energetic adventurer, Camus took a deep breath and slowly exhaled. We just finished work. We can finally rest. Yesterday, he had monitored the Briou Motel late into the night. All I want now is a good night's sleep. After exploring the dream together last night, Re wasn't as reticent as before when facing Lumian. Then why are you still drinking coffee? Lumian replied with amusement. It was evident that Re and Camus lacked the energy of a sleepless. I want to endure until dinner before sleeping, Camus said with a sigh. Re shook her head. Coffee is useless to me. After a brief chat, Re finished her corn nut cake and coffee, then headed back to the nearby police headquarters to rest. Camus continued to recline in the armchair, occasionally taking a sip of coffee. Has Riza arrived? Lumian inquired with a smile. Camus fell silent for a moment. He's here. Tonight, one of the two Maslow and Lobin will be following you with him. As for Colobo, there was no need for him to be on duty. If he didn't even dare to look, how could he do any monitoring? While they conversed, Lumian noticed Miss Amandina from Palm Manor leading a short unicorn outside the Bunya Café, exuding high spirits. The blue-eyed girl was clad in off-white hunting attire today, her black hair fashioned into a half-height bun. After entrusting the whip and reins to the brown-skinned valet, she strolled to the kitchen counter with her lady's maid, who also bore an intision appearance. Along the way, she cheerfully greeted the patrons in the café and exchanged pleasantries with the locals sipping on inexpensive coffee. Observing Camus's gaze fixed on the girl, Lumian teased, Do you wish to engage in a duel with her fiancé? No, I'm not that kind of person, Camus replied with a serious expression. I admit that she's indeed very attractive to me, but she's already engaged to Monsieur Robert. 
This is a sign that she's starting a family. I can't allow myself to destroy someone else's family. You Phanapaterians, Lumian didn't mock him but sighed with emotion. Such values appealed to Phanapater. Of course, not every Phanapaterian possessed such values. Seeing Lumian's lack of response, Camus said seriously, don't have any ideas about her. Lumian regarded the young man surnamed Castia with amusement, awaiting further explanation. Camus furrowed his brow slightly. I know you and Tisians won't back down just because the other party has a fiancé or a husband. You might find it even more exciting, but you always pursue momentary pleasure. Very few are willing to take responsibility. You always satisfy yourself. When you're happy, you turn around and leave, leaving a lady to face everything that's been destroyed. Not every intision is like this, Lumian shook his head with a smile. But most Tririans are like that. However, neither party is innocent in such matters, he added inwardly. The energetic and playful Amandina led the ladies made past Camus and Lumian's table. First, she greeted Camus, then sized up Lumian and said candidly, I'm Amandina, what about you? Louis Berry, Lumian replied with a smile. Amandina nodded and suddenly laughed. You must have just arrived from Trier. You're different from the people here. No, I'm from a village in the south, Lumian switched to Intision with a Darij accent. Amandina wasn't disappointed. She happily inquired about the folklore of the southern provinces of the Intis Republic before leading the ladies' maid to a table in the corner. Camus watched as the two of them conversed. He opened his mouth but closed it again. Trier, Courtier de la Cathedrale Commemorative Jenna was curled up on the sofa, engrossed in the novels she had just bought, all with elements of witches. Suddenly, Rabbit Chasel appeared in front of her and handed her a letter. Observing the bizarre yet adorable rabbit-shaped creature, Jenna opened the letter and scanned its contents before asking earnestly, Do you wish to select your payment, or shall I choose a random book for you? Lumian Lee has already settled the payment on your behalf, Rabbit Chasel said in a deep yet sincere voice, which Jenna suddenly felt a sense of foreboding. What has he paid? He imparted shooting-related knowledge to me and guided me through the initial stage of my practice. Rabbit Chasel raised the special revolver in his hand, briefly aimed it at the door behind Jenna, and then swiftly lowered it. W.H. Monsieur Lumian Lee, have you considered the consequences of what you've done? Jenna chided, feeling a mix of irritation and amusement. However, the deed was done, and she was powerless to reverse it. As these thoughts raced through her mind, Jenna's lips curved into a sweet smile. The next payment will be for a genuine underarm holster. And after that, custom-made bullets with special effects. How does that sound? Behind his glass glasses, Rabbit Chasel's eyes sparkled. All right. In Tizimo Town, night had already fallen, and darkness shrouded the area. Lumian stood in Hisoka's house, glancing at the stern vice. Captain of the Port Pilos patrol team, Riza, and the local patrol team leader, Maslow, whose face was adorned with white paint. As though instructing Lugano, he said, Watch out for any accidents. This time, he spoke in Dutonese. All right. It wasn't the first time Maslow had accompanied Louis Berry, the great adventurer, and he was already accustomed to his style. Dressed in a sleek formal suit, Riza remained silent signaling that there was no issue. Lumian retrieved the brown mystery prying glasses from his traveler's bag. Tonight, his first task was to use this magical item to observe Hisoka's house from various angles, hoping to unveil the source of its abnormality. After confirming his condition and preparations, Lumian placed the brown gold-rimmed glasses on the bridge of his nose. A familiar wave of dizziness washed over Lumian, as if his surroundings had been disrupted and reassembled. He witnessed poisonous insects crawling in the sky, two walls that seemed to dance in circles, and an underground water puddle deep in the soil that appeared to absorb all light. Chapter 670 Sudden Arrival Amidst the dizzying sensation that threatened to separate his spirit from his body, Lumian saw trees that seemed to slumber in the darkness and a pitch-black boulder. 
Finally, he removed the brown glasses from his nose and arched his back slightly to alleviate the discomfort. Even an ascetic wouldn't be able to use the mystery prying glasses for long. Of course, this ensured his safety to a certain degree. Through this prying, Lumian confirmed two things. First, the area beneath Hisoka's house was indeed unusual, but it seemed more like an illusory symbol than an actual entity. It indicated that this place had once been corrupted or influenced, with the most severe occurrence taking place underground. Second, this influence was connected to the black boulder deep within the primitive forest. How did it go? Maslow, his face painted white, asked. Lumian stored the mystery prying glasses back into his traveler's bag and smiled. The abnormality I saw here originates from a black boulder deep in the primitive forest. Have you ever seen or heard of that black boulder? The pale white Riza and Maslow, his black hair falling over his shoulders, shook their heads in unison, indicating a negative answer. Lumian wasn't in a rush to do the second thing he had planned for the night. He glanced at Riza, who was wearing a thin formal suit and appeared to be a mix of Intision and West Balam heritage. He casually said, I thought that with your arrival, some people in Tizimo would gradually leave and stay in Port Pylos for a while. As you know, the Dream Festival should start within three days. Riza calmly replied, Based on my experience, except for those who have only arrived in Tizimo in the past two weeks, it's best not to leave this place and go elsewhere to prevent any abnormalities from spreading. It should only be considered after the Dream Festival ends and the primitive tribe launches another attack. Very standardized process. I thought you would consider the opinions of Intis, Finapater, and other northern continent countries, allowing people with corresponding nationalities to evacuate in advance and protect them. For example, the owners of the plantations outside the city and their families. Yes, this is likely because the Dream Festival has never shown direct harm. It only caused some townsfolk to suffer from hysteria and attracted an attack from the forest's primitive tribe. The first situation could be resolved by a simple mass. The second problem could be guarded against and fended off. Lumian roughly understood the mentality of Admiral Quirrell and the patrol team's leaders. Since there wouldn't be any major issues, they would act as if the Dream Festival didn't exist, merely advising the local official Bayonders to be vigilant and guard against any mishaps while hoping that the Church of the Fool could resolve the hidden dangers. If they were to do more, they might trigger something and worsen the situation. After discussing the matter, Lumian recovered from the discomfort caused by the mystery prying glasses. He took out the unique Eye of Truth and placed it in front of his face. The relatively handsome southern continent native's eyelids twitched at the sight of the pale white flesh, dark blood vessel-like earmuff and spectacle temple, as well as the blood-colored lens intertwined with transparent purple tubes. How many glasses does Louis Berry own? Moreover, each one is a mystical item. After donning the single lens eye of truth, Lumian surveyed his surroundings, seeking to uncover the truth behind reality. As he did so, a voice gradually sounded in his ears, growing louder and more chaotic. Each note and word seemed to materialize, flooding into Lumian's mind. It made him feel as if his head was rapidly expanding like a balloon. If the balloon continued to expand, there would only be one outcome, bursting with a resounding bang. Lumian reached for his ear, ready to remove the eye of truth at any moment. He seized the opportunity to scrutinize Hisoka's house. He believed that it was safer to take the risk of prying into the house's secrets before the dream festival, while not inside the special dream. It was safer than using the eye of truth and mystery prying glasses within the dream itself. Through the purple lens, Lumian couldn't discern much of the truth. Everything appeared similar to what he could see with his naked eye, but the night seemed even darker. Without hesitation, his eye bulged and blood vessels appeared on his body. He abruptly removed the eye of truth and a slightly sharp explosion reverberated in his ears. Phew, phew. Panting heavily, Lumian's mind was in disarray, overwhelmed by a barrage of strange knowledge, he couldn't think straight. At that moment, even if someone were to ambush him, he wouldn't be able to react quickly. 
After more than ten seconds, Lumian finally regained his ability to think clearly. He instinctively organized the knowledge that had been forcefully injected into his mind. The Art of Sophistry How to Cultivate Superior Wheat Seeds Canning Techniques How to Roast Pork That's Crispy on the Outside and Tender on the Inside Music to Soothe a So's Emotions The Revelation of Evernight Favorite Positions of Celebrities' Memoirs of Those Mistresses What's all this nonsense? Can't there be any useful knowledge? In the past, although Auror had been tormented by the hidden sage's installation of knowledge, she had at least stumbled upon valuable mysticism insights. Wait, had she also been corrupted by such knowledge? Is that why she always portrays a rich theoretical understanding in her books? Lumian rubbed his still throbbing head and said to Risa and Maslow, I'm going to the edge of the forest to take a look. Do you want to come with me? Riza nodded, stingy with his words, while Maslow made his stance clear by walking towards the stairs. If Camus were here, he would undoubtedly smile wryly and say, Do I have a choice? Lumian mused to himself. He left Hisoka's house and made his way towards the primitive forest near Tizimo town. After crossing the intersection and arriving at another street, Lumian noticed a four-wheeled, four-seater carriage parked at the entrance of the Brio Motel. An attendant and a lady's maid stepped out of the carriage, carrying their luggage, and followed a man and a woman towards the motel. The man was attired in a dark gray formal suit and a half-top hat. His complexion resembled that of someone from the northern continent, and his side profile was well-defined, with striking dark green eyes. The woman wore a light, colored dress that allowed for ease of movement and a feathered hat adorned with pearls. She appeared to be in her late twenties, and her skin was delicate and radiant. One would easily determine that she was a beauty just from glimpsing her side profile. Lumian averted his gaze and turned to Riza and Maslow. Is it the weekend? No, Maslow replied, understanding the implication behind Louis Berry's question. Gentlemen and ladies often find time to hunt in Tizimo, not just on weekends. Lumian turned to Risa and inquired, You didn't seal off this area? That would only cause unnecessary panic, Risa responded succinctly. Lumian didn't press the matter further. He walked out of the town through the Brio Motel and ventured into the primitive forest. He delved deeper along the path he had become familiar with from the dream. Finally, he arrived at the chaotic zone in reality, where various dream fragments intertwined. It was an unremarkable place, indistinguishable from its surroundings. Lumian found a palm tree and sat down. He turned to Risa and Maslow and said, Keep an eye on my surroundings. I'm going to sleep here. He wanted to see what would happen if he fell asleep closer to the source of the abnormality, if he could enter that peculiar dream, and in what state. Receiving affirmative responses from the two patrol team members, Lumian closed his eyes and attempted cogitation. At some point, he drifted off to sleep. After an unknown period, he awoke. Catching sight of Risa and Maslow, Lumian rose to his feet and nodded thoughtfully. This place doesn't work either. Is Hisoka's house the only effective location? Or should I find that black boulder and sleep near it? Lumian gazed into the pitch-black forest, contemplating for a few moments before turning to Riza and Maslow. Let's head back. The trio swiftly returned to Tizimo. The late night had settled in, and the streets were devoid of any passers-by. No lights or sounds emanated from the houses on either side. Occasionally, the snorts of livestock on the ground floor of the buildings could be heard, accentuating the pervading darkness and silence. The dim crimson moon's light seemed to emphasize the depths of the darkness. On this dark night, Lumian walked along a muddy road, heading towards the Brio Motel situated deep within the street. Risa and Maslow followed quietly behind him. Suddenly, Lumian's mind spun and his vision momentarily blurred before clearing. This is, his pupils dilated as he instinctively scanned his surroundings but found nothing amiss. At that moment, in a vacant house on the ground floor diagonally ahead, a dim candlelight illuminated a room on the third floor. 
Immediately after, glass windows on this street and throughout Tizimo town were set aglow by the light of burning candles. Ri awoke to find that darkness had already descended, but the candles in many houses continued to burn. This indicated that it wasn't too late. Feeling lazy, Ri had no desire to prepare her own food. Carrying her bow and arrows, she left the room and exited the police headquarters from the side, making her way towards the nearby Bunia Cafe. The streets were nearly deserted, as they were every night. Ri glanced at the tables and chairs still scattered along the street and approached the kitchen counter. In Dutnese, she said to the busy cafe owner and waiter Bunya, who had his head lowered, a glass of kosa and a beef burrito. Bunya paused in the midst of washing cups and looked up. His naturally curly black hair gave him a mixed blood appearance. He looked at Ri and revealed an obvious, strange smile that made Ri inexplicably uneasy. Ri knew Bunya well and was aware that he was a shy, kind, and adult man who wasn't particularly adept at communicating with women. He had never smiled like this before. Bunya fixed his gaze on Ri and chuckled in a deep voice. You've got big boobs, 